Hey, this morning uh, I'm here with uh, Becca Harris-Samoevich, who is uh, head of our biosimilars team. And we're here to talk about the uh, Amgen Sandoz uh, decision earlier this week in the U.S. Supreme Court and um, try and give a, an overview for, um, for perhaps the businessman and uh, to some extent uh, lawyers who may practice uh, other than in our field. Uh, Becky, let me start uh, by asking you uh, this. Uh, what's going on between the businessmen that would lead them to take a case uh, proverbially all the way to the Supreme Court? Um, Amgen is a brand name manufacturer of biologics um, and Sandoz is the equivalent of a generic manufacturer of a biologic. The main issue here is when Sandoz can bring that generic form of the biologic, which we call biosimilars, to market. Okay, so the sooner Sandoz can sell its biosimilar, yes. uh, the more money Sandoz can make. Yes, and that okay. is millions of okay. dollars. Yeah. These are not small numbers. Right. And uh, then uh, presumably the longer that Amgen can hold Sandoz at bay, the more, Amgen the more those millions Amgen can make. So that's sort of the lay of the landscape sure. uh, here. So first of all, what is a biologic? A biologic is similar to a drug in that it can be used to treat illness or improve your health. However, it is not chemically synthesized. Rather, it is manufactured or man-made in living systems, which can include yeast, viruses, um, human cells, animal cells, etc. What makes something a biosimilar? A biosimilar essentially equivalent to a biologic, um, meaning it operates in much the same way. Um, this is comparable to the comparison of generics and brand name drugs. If there's just Amgen and um, they have a, uh, uh, a chemical compound uh, per se or a biologic, uh, uh, who decides whether or not they can sell those to the American public? The FDA issues licenses for all drugs and biologics before they may be marketed. Okay. Essentially, they want safety and efficacy. So okay. They want to know that it works and that it's safe to use. The first person to the table, which is called the reference product sponsor, they have to show tons of clinical testing data to the FDA to show or prove that there's efficacy and safety. So a lot of heavy lifting on the part of the first guy. Yeah, a lot of time and money spent in research okay. and development. The second guy to come to the table gets to skip a lot of those steps to show efficacy and safety right. if they can show that what they are bringing to the table is essentially the same. In an effort to balance the incentive to patent owners to create new biologics and drugs um, and the consumer's interest in having affordable access to medicines. Congress initially acted in 1984, the Hatch-Waxman Act, which allowed generic manufacturers of drugs to begin making and using the drug before a patent expired in anticipation of their ability to sell that drug when that patent expired. So now fast forward to 2009 when we realized that the Hatch-Waxman Act does not apply to biologics. So as part of the Affordable Care Act or Obamacare, uh, the Biologics Price Competition and Innovation Act, which is a subchapter, was created to essentially mirror Hatch-Waxman but apply to biologics and biosimilars. What was the biologic of interest? What's, what is it? What's the drug? Uh, the initial drug is Neupogen. Uh, in particular, after radiation treatments, um, cancer patients have very low white blood cell counts. Okay. Um, their bodies can't produce the neutrophils as well. So this biologic essentially um, stimulates the growth of neutrophils in those patients. One step further, white blood cells counter infection. Okay. I'll bring us back to Sandoz and Amgen and their particular uh, status in the, in the middle of this, uh, this fight. Sandoz filed an abbreviated new biologic application. That application starts this whole back and forth between the name brand uh, manufacturer and the second guy to the table. Okay. Um, so there's a provision of the statute that says 
the second guy to the table has to give the first guy 180 days notice before he, the second guy can introduce its biosimilar to market. Okay. The question is whether or not the FDA is able to issue that license before the patent term expires. If Sandoz is taking advantage of the statutory scheme to get a biosimilar to market as soon as possible, um, they have to tell both the FDA and Amgen what's going on. They yes. can't sort of have a secret application to the FDA that Amgen doesn't know about. Yes. So they have to give notice to Amgen that the application exists and it has been filed. The and that's different from the 180 days from when they yes, that's are different. going to sell it. Okay. So the question, though, is what does that notice include? Do you only have to tell them you are applying, or do you also need to provide the application itself? The statute says that you need to provide the application itself. However, the statute was very poorly drafted. And so there's a lot of ambiguity as to what the word We are shocked, means. shocked. All right, go ahead. <laughs> this essentially turns on the use of shall. Yeah. That provision says that Sandoz shall provide its application with all its details to Amgen. Yeah. However, later in that same statute, the word shall is used permissively, and it's not a requirement. So the whole question is whether or not Sandoz had to provide their application to Amgen and then begin what we call the patent dance. So as part of this statute, it envisioned a process in which the second guy, Sandoz, gives Amgen their application with all of its details. Amgen then comes back to Sandoz and says, theoretically, if everything had worked out the way it was intended, with a list of patents it potentially believed would be infringed by this drug. They would be back and forth between the two parties and they would decide which patents they would choose to litigate initially in a first stage of litigation and which they would litigate later after the drug is entering the market. Okay. And so actually as a way of giving the first guy, which here would have been Amgen, um, the ability to know ahead of time what patents might be infringed so if they do seek an injunction or declaratory judgment they have a good faith basis on making that claim of, of infringement. Um, it also gives the second guy the ability to sort of dictate what they're going to litigate first and what they're going to leave for later and get some of these issues resolved before there's market uncertainty or before the second guy invests a lot of money bringing their drug or their biologic to market um, and not knowing if they are going to be sued for infringement. Okay. Now, what did Sandoz do or didn't do that got them sued by Amgen? The issue here is that the statute requires 180 day notice prior to the second guy selling their product. Um, initially, they gave the 180 days notice before the 12 year exclusivity period had expired. They also gave 100, they also gave that notice again at the end of that 12 year expiration and at the date in which the license became effective. So Amgen wanted the Northern District of California to say the first notice was improper and only the second notice counts. And so Sandoz would be prevented from selling their product until 180 days or six months after that 12 years expired. So Amgen essentially wanted an additional 180 days exclusivity beyond the initial 12 years. Okay, okay, that makes sense. So, okay, that, that makes sense. In other words, uh, Sandoz was trying to get its 180 days uh, get its horse to the starting gate mm -hmm. uh, right at the end of the 12 year guaranteed uh, uh, exclusive period. And uh, Sandoz, or Amgen, excuse me, was uh, saying, no, uh, you can't even bring your horse to the starting gate until uh, 
uh, the 180 uh, until yes. the 12 years is, is done, yes. and then you have to wait 180 more days. Yes. The second thing Amgen wanted was access to Sandoz's application and right. all the data. The Northern District of California basically ruled against Amgen in everything. They said that Sandoz was not required to turn over their application to Amgen, um, and they said that Sandoz's early notice prior to the 12 year expiration was proper. Okay, so they Sandoz got to keep it secret, so to speak, yep. and it got to get its head start. Yes. Okay, then what happened? So that was appealed to the Federal Circuit. The Federal Circuit said that no application was required to be provided to Amgen. Okay. However, the Federal Circuit said that the advance notice the Sandoz gave Amgen before the expiration of the 12 years was improper. Okay. But the Federal Circuit essentially said that Amgen did get an extra 180 days after the 12 years exclusivity period. The Supreme Court said that one, the patent dance is not a requirement, and whether or not the statute requires or would have required Sandoz to turn over its application to Amgen may be up to the states to decide. <laughs> Well, and I'll yeah, get into yeah, that yeah, yeah, further. Yeah, yeah. Um, Supreme Court also overturned the Federal Circuit's decision uh, regarding the 180 days notice. Supreme Court said that advance notice is fine. So long as the license is actually granted, meaning the license begins once the 12 years expires, that's enough. Okay. Now, the bottom line might be uh, that um, there's a um, horribly confusing set of statutes and regulations. Uh, patent protection uh, is, uh, of course, important to Amgen because it gives them the second uh, uh, protection. The FDA gives them 12 years of protection minimum, and the Supreme Court basically said that the second guy can get a bit of a head start, mm -hmm. and in a world where tens of thousands or hundreds of thousands or millions of dollars a day of the product are, are either being sold or could be sold, mm -hmm. the value of 180 days literally it's makes huge. it while, worthwhile to take your case to Supreme Court. Yes. Okay. All right. uh, what, what, what's, what's muddled? Well, first, the Supreme Court said that that patent dance, that back and forth between the first guy to the table and the second guy to the table, is essentially optional, uh, which means that the Amgens of the world could be forced to sue for declaratory judgment or for infringement before knowing the scope of that alleged infringement. The whole statutory framework's purpose was to avoid that. So now we have a situation where you would essentially have to be flying blind. The second issue is they remanded a portion of this case down. It has to do what, with whether or not the Amgens of the world could get a declaratory judgment or an injunction in um, California under unfair competition. The Supreme Court remanded to the Federal Circuit the issue of whether or not the Amgens of the world could sue under state law for violations of federal law here. The question here, though, is whether or not a s different state could come out differently on whether or not this optional provision violating that could constitute something unlawful, which would trigger the state law um, statute or whether that state law would be preempted by federal law. So there's a whole lot of ambiguity as to, in practice, how this is going to play out. And the Supreme Court did not answer it, and they just threw it back down. Okay, so we, we remain in a bit of a state of flux and maybe looking for some clarification in months to come. Yes. Okay. All right, thank you, Becky.